Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining us for our presentation today, 10 Steps to Effective Elicitation Requirements. My name is Leah Holmes and I will be your moderator today. This session is being recorded and will be distributed after the webinar. For clean audio, we have muted everyone, so feel free to send questions using the question box on the lower right-hand side of your screen, and we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. Before we start, here's a little bit about ourselves. Corporate Education Group designs and delivers talent development solutions that align with organizational strategy to transform employee and team performance. More than 30 years of experience rooted in corporate training enables us to engage in collaborative partnerships with clients and tailor solutions that unlock business value. Through our strategic alliance with Duke University Management Training, we also offer premier certificate programs backed by renowned higher education institution. Today's webinar will be presented by Terrell Smith. Terrell is a senior trainer and consultant for Corporate Education Group. Terrell comes from both business and technical backgrounds, having worked in corporate and government environments. With over 25 years of experience in a wide range of project management and business analysis assignments, he brings concepts to life in a practical, easy to apply manner. Terrell has assisted clients in the development of project management methodologies, <laughs> risk assessments, quality management, agile methods, problem solving, rescuing troubled projects, implementing business analysis best practices, and team building. He has been facilitating classes and workshops now for over 10 years in both the traditional and virtual classrooms. Thank you, Terrell, for being here today. I will now turn the presentation over to you. Hey, thank you uh, very much, Leah, and uh, a cordial welcome to everybody today uh, coming to you from Denver, Colorado, and actually doing a class here, so uh, that's good. Uh, today's topic, of course, is 10 Steps to Effective Requirement Solicitation, as uh, Leah indicated. And so in this uh, instance, we'll be talking about a variety of the methods uh, we can employ uh, as uh, either as project managers or as business analysts. Uh, to identify and effectively define the requirements, uh, ensuring that indeed we do uh, properly involve our stakeholders uh, as we apply the appropriate techniques uh, given the situation uh, that we might be involved in. Okay, so the, the first uh, topic we'll take a look at uh, has to do in these 10 steps will be we have to really understand the application domain and we'll talk in, in more detail about each of these, just give you a little overview of these uh, 10 uh, steps. So first off, we have to understand the application domain. And of course, then we have to figure out where we're going to go to to be able to get these requirements. And of course, that has to do with both uh, what we don't know and what we need to fill in the blanks with, which again, come from our stakeholders. We have to really know what, what information we need and who are, mo are the most appropriate stakeholders for us to be able to engage uh, in the overall process. Also, there are a a whole pile of techniques we can apply here. It's all about identifying the, the types of information we're after, the stakeholders we might be involved with, and then picking and selecting the most valuable techniques. And I say techniques, not just technique, uh, like interviews, uh, to uh, be able to leverage uh, our, uh, ourselves effectively uh, to gather good re uh, requirements. So again, we'll talk about that. As well as, again, we have to be prepared uh, to uh, be engaged here. So it's all about preparation for the selected elicitation techniques that we think are going to best uh, help us to uh, pinpoint uh, and uh, identify and document the requirements uh, for our stakeholders. The fifth step, of course, is to begin to document an overall approach. This typically lines up with uh, developing a straw man uh, I guess we could say a straw person these days, but uh, anyway, just trying to make sure we are able to generate the right conversation and to get the ball rolling as far as getting people engaged and having something to work with as a key starting point rather than saying, yeah, do you know what you want? Uh, no, I'm not sure I know what I want, but uh, maybe we'll figure it out. So good starting point is to have something to kind of chew on as a group uh, to ensure uh, you know, what it is and to, to uh, instill that uh, good, right conversation. Also, again, we'll take a look at this in terms of the overall information that needs to be provided to the various uh, stakeholders. 
uh, trying to get that out in advance so they are prepared. Uh, anything from an agenda to a document uh, to anything that would help to facilitate uh, gaining and gathering uh, additional levels of understanding so people are prepared uh, for the, uh, the series of elicitation events. Seven, of course, has to do uh, with our ability then to elicit those requirements, and this is really kind of where the rubber meets the road here in our attempt to, to be able to elicit the requirements from the appropriate stakeholders. As mentioned, preparation is key here, but this is where the heavy lifting begins uh, because we're trying then to elicit the information directly from the various sources. Step eight, uh, good notes are critically important. I can't tell you how many times uh, we find in, in organizations where we have some kind of elicitation event, and then of course after the fact that nobody has anything to show for it. Uh, uh, one organization I worked with, uh, they went to, to visit another organization to kind of see the way that they implemented a system, and everybody showed up, spent a couple of days there, uh, everybody came back, and of course nobody had taken notes, it was all about kind of recollections and they really never did anything with it. So, so it's important to have mechanisms in place and the presence of mind uh, to be able to capture that information in whatever form and format that might take. Also, it's all about trying to get good standardized uh, templates that allow us then to organize and to be able to format uh, the requirements accordingly. Uh, and so standard template, whether it be a BRD or a product backlog, are important uh, mechanisms to have in place. Uh, so we're able to look at everything from the various levels of requirements, from business requirements, uh, to stakeholder requirements, uh, to solution requirements, uh, to functional and non-functional requirements, transition requirements, uh, business rules, you know, all the things uh, that make up a package of, uh, of requirements. And lastly, we'll take a look then at how we uh, then uh, provide techniques and mechanisms to be able to validate those requirements to make sure we've got those correct. Uh, of course, they need to be able to be usable for the uh, actual developers, and of course, they need to re clearly reflect uh, the interest of the overall business uh, and uh, what their intended uh, solution should, should begin to look like uh, as that is implemented. So again, that's kind of typically called verification uh, and validation. Okay, let's take a look at these in just a little bit more detail, and let's get started here by coming up with a definition of elicitation. So, required solicitation is, as you can see here, guess what? It is a process. Now, if we have a bunch of recollections of hallway conversations, maybe a bunch of sticky notes, maybe a few snapshots of uh, whiteboards, uh, is that really uh, a process, and do we really have a good set of requirements in hand as a result of that? Uh, maybe we want to have be a little bit more organized, uh, worked with a healthcare organization in California recently where they wanted to formalize their requirements process. Uh, they actually established a business analyst center of excellence, kind of sort of like a PMO, but for business analysis type activities, uh, which really just detailed the, the process steps and the templates and tools that can be applied here. Uh, to document the requirements. So yeah, we're trying to formalize the solicitation to the extent possible. And of course, that means we have to have a philosophy, we have to have a set of processes that allow us then to, yeah, discover, to review, to document, to really to understand those overall needs. Ultimately, there might be some constraints we have to be aware of, and of course, we have to account for and, and be able to document those as well. So yeah, we're trying to formalize uh, the overall requirement solicitation process uh, to the extent possible. Okay, so number one here, as I mentioned, trying to understand the application domain is the first order of business. A beginning point here was would be is, uh, you know, well, uh, what is this organization all about? Of course, the domain could be payroll, domain could be marketing, domain could be uh, um, customer support. And so these are all various application domains that we need to be aware of. And so we really need to identify, you know, kind of where is the information, uh, basically SMEs in, in those areas that can uh, kind of enlighten us as far as what they do, uh, their, their work processes, their work products are part of the process here. Also, we need to kind of tap into, you know, where are the problem areas uh, that uh, maybe got problem reports could be part of this, but you know, what, what are the problems they're trying to face here? Uh, and uh, what are the you know, plausible uh, options that we can put on the table uh, to then provide solutions uh, for these problems uh, within those individual domains. 
So ultimately, we're trying to you know gather that information so we really quickly come up to speed in our ability to represent that information in very meaningful ways to make sure it's captured, documented, and of course shared with the various stakeholders. So we really know what this is, a part, uh, is about. Now, I've been doing online training for a number of years. Uh, I've helped a couple of companies set up online training programs. Uh, and then I just had an assignment uh, uh, recently within the last couple of years where I worked at the university. Uh, and so, so, I mean, that was a different domain area. So, you know, I, I was, I've been in the corporate uh, uh, training, uh, online training for, for, for years, but I've never really been in the university training area for, for the online. So I actually started working with the online group to understand their needs, to document their projects, uh, uh, to document uh, their requirements. And so I had to, you know, kind of come up to, to speed with the university environment just because, yeah, I've had background in online, but uh, not specifically just in a university space. So, so yeah, we have to really understand and, and grow our knowledge uh, about that uh, application domain that we might be working with uh, given the assigned project. Now, an important part of this is to, to undertake what we call domain analysis. And so this is just trying to take that more in-depth look about what this organization is about, uh, what they do, uh, what are some of their key deliverables, uh, and again, what are the resources that they can actually uh, assist us with uh, to, uh, you know, to contribute to the information. Uh, at, at this university, it was actually Brigham Young University, Idaho, uh, where they um, had what they call instructor managers. And so we actually were able to get some time with the instructor managers. Uh, and, uh, there's another group called instructor development. And so we, we got a chance to tap into those resources. And uh, we actually had one of the instructor managers uh, dedicated uh, half time uh, to that undertaking. So yeah, we do need uh, some good face time with the resources to really understand that domain. Uh, again, as mentioned, the, the problems that might be associated with that domain. And so again, just trying to learn as much as we can and just trying to get some real world examples. Uh, and of course, in this online group, uh, they uh, hadn't had really a lot of IT support. And so they actually, their system was, guess what? Google Docs, that was their system, all on private accounts. <laughs> so that was not, not very robust, very structured, but that was their area. And you know, I had to come up to speed with their domain. I understand again, we need to automate a lot of this and make it a lot easier for them to be able to use. And so again, that, that's always a key beginning point as we uh, kind of set the stage uh, for effective requirement solicitation. Now, one of my favorite tools at the outset of any elicitation undertaking is to do a context diagram uh, like the one we show here. So this actually allows us to define the domain as well as the domain boundary. So it's really kind of a good scoping tool to understand who are all the actors, uh, that are going to be part of this system. Again, we've got employees, uh, we've got uh, finance, uh, we've got uh, content management system, of course, all the other actors that are involved in the process here. We've been able to identify uh, what they put into the system, what should be coming out of the system. And so that's always a good, like a 5,000 foot view about the domain, that business domain, and really understanding the needs. This can also be decomposed into a particular system. I mean, this could be like, you know, the, the uh, one of the projects we did at the university is called the Instructor Management System. Uh, and so, and that could be the name within that bubble, Instructor Management. Of course, you know, all the other players, you know, like adjunct professors, uh, uh, the uh, um, instructor managers, all the management piece, administrative folks. Uh, um, we link this up with survey tools. Uh, uh, ticketing systems, and so again, those all can be part of those those actors to make up the boundaries and the flow of information between all those various players. So again, a context diagram, a great tool to set down initially as you begin the elicitation activities uh, to define those domain boundaries. Step two then is to figure out, you know, where do I need to go to get this information? Uh, at the university, they actually had a great uh, org chart online where I could you know, go in and look at the online leadership, I could look at the IT leadership, all the other workers who reported to whom. Uh, and so again, it's just a really good source of trying to identify where I need to go to begin to tap into those requirements. Uh, as mentioned, you know, good sources, of course, uh, link very closely with good requirements. So you have to make sure you identify the right players out there uh, that can help us to gain additional insight and can really be assisting us in, in facilitating the gathering of those requirements. And so we're really trying to get you know, the, the questions answered we, we post there. So, you know, where do we begin to gather the requirements? Uh, who are the key sources? Uh, what happens if we miss a source? Again, if you're going to miss some sources, 
you're definitely going to miss some requirements and that's not going to be a good thing of course it depends if you're doing waterfall or agile not as big of an issue if you're doing agile type projects a uh, no big issue if you're doing waterfall projects or something in between maybe they call that wagile <laughs> waterfall agile so we see you know, a lot of organizations kind of migrating there so i mean this really applies in either the environments whether you're doing that during a sprint or whether you're doing that during your requirements gathering process on a waterfall project, we really need to make sure we do identify, identify all the key players. Here's again just some examples of sources we might want to uh, to tap into and uh, leave no stakeholder or source behind. I mean, there are some very obvious stakeholders that are out there. Also going back to the context diagram, I mean, that identifies the actors. And of course, some of those actors can be sources of information that have been identified via the context diagram. And, uh, you know, you can get, uh, you know, all the key players together there and begin to brainstorm those sources that might be relevant to input into the overall requirements process. Now, of course, one of my favorite techniques to use here, of course, is called stakeholder analysis. Uh, you can find this uh, in the PMBOK guide as well. Uh, but uh, as we analyze the sources, you know, first off, uh, we want to find out the people that have a lot of influence on the overall project. And, of course, the people that uh, might be fully engaged here, of course, are the one that gives us the direction about where we're headed. Uh, and they are key stakeholders uh, for the overall project in this power and influence grid, so power and interest grid. So, of course, the power can be formalized power. That could be, you know, product knowledge, uh, uh, process knowledge, uh, technical knowledge. I mean, that you can also wield power just around that. So, we have to kind of be aware of those. And then, of course, we identify the high power, less interested. Of course, those are the people that are in the upper left-hand quadrant. Uh, keep them satisfied, but also try to win them over, get them onto our side to help them become more and fully engaged in the overall process here, because that can be a detriment to our, our, our ability to get, gather requirements to be effective if we don't get the buy-in from people that might wield some influence over the, the project. Of course, low power, uh, low uh, low interest. Uh, these are kind of the minimal effort uh, folks here. I'm not going to worry too much about them at this point in time. Just kind of monitor that could change over time. And of course, lastly, we have the low power. Uh, I'm sorry, low power, and of course, less interested. Oh, I'm sorry, they got those backwards. So, so low power, low interest is, is the bottom left hand quadrant. Uh, the people that are low power but high interest are the ones, of course, are our cheerleaders. They're our key source of knowledge. Uh, they're the doers, basically. So again, we wanna make sure we keep those folks in the loop as well and to keep them informed. So once again, we're just trying to organize our, our efforts in terms of listing the requirements by understanding, first off, who are all the stakeholders, the sources, uh, what is their ability to influence the project from a power standpoint, and what is their level of interest. So again, we can kind of operationalize that and uh, make that a lot more effective as we tap into the sources and kind of know the lay of the land amongst all the various stakeholders. Step three then is to kind of pick and choose the appropriate techniques and approaches that would help us to get to those requirements. And so there are a bunch of techniques that are out there. And so, you know, we could do things like initially do a brainstorming session just to get all the ideas out on the table uh, to ensure we are getting good uh, you know, and, and effective information. Uh, might be one way of doing that. Also, we could do interviews. I mean, that's the tried and true tool of most business analysts is to do interviews. Of course, you have to be prepared to have a good set of questions, which include both open and closed-ended questions as we engage the stakeholders and doing interviews uh, to gather additional levels of information. We have to, of course, determine if we're going to do individual interviews, are we going to do group interviews, uh, what's the, the form and format of that, are these internal stakeholders, in, external stakeholders, to understand their knowledge and, and how they can best contribute uh, to our uh, overall requirements acquisition. Over the years, uh, I've sent out questionnaires. If you have a large group of people, you want to get a lot of information. I tend to find this more a underutilized uh, technique that we can maybe more effectively introduce uh, with a lot of the uh, the various uh, uh, survey tools that are available to us these days. It makes that a whole lot easier. Um, again, typically we want more closed-ended questions on surveys to get more quantitative information, maybe with a few open-ended questions. And so questionnaires, another uh, good tool to, to be able to consider. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, trying to uh, you know, in incorporate uh, some new ways of doing business. 
Also, we can work to, directly with that, that target environment uh, as well and maybe do a little job shadowing uh, to really understand the environment. Uh, could be uh, active uh, shadowing, uh, might have to be passive uh, shadowing, but just, just to kind of understand what's going on uh, based on, on what's, what's, what's there. Also, we can evaluate other ones that, that might be similar to what we're doing right now, and so this helps to kind of broaden our understanding, uh, further kind of vet the overall requirements, as look at something that might be very, be very similar uh, to what we're currently using might be another option that we can we can take on. Also, we'll go back and do a little historical uh, review, and this is basically document analysis, what documents are available to us, so we can get a little bit more insight about the problems, look at maybe some recommendations that might be out there as we, we gain a better appreciation, uh, can be just another insight. Of course, this is typically current state, not future state, but at least it gives us a, you know, a, a, a marker in, along the way to kind of understand, uh, you know, where things are at uh, from their experience. Support teams, always a good insight uh, as we, we, we tap into another resource available to us and maybe do some interviews uh, uh, or uh, we might even do some focus groups as part of the process here uh, to kind of get their take on maybe the existing system, the way it's working, the problem areas and trying to elicit information to, in, the, in, in that forum might be a, an option as well. And also, you know, that people are always uh, looking for better ways of doing things. Sometimes we call these hidden factories. Uh, and of course, the hidden factories are, here's the procedure, but this is the way we're doing things because, you know, the procedure is not really helping us to be effective or efficient. So we might do a little value stream analysis to get a little better idea as far as how that's playing out. And again, look towards, uh, you know, ways of improving things based on recommendations. This kind of goes back to uh, quality circles that were implemented in Japan way back in the 50s and uh, probably still being used here. There is, uh, you know, users are empowered to make recommendations for improving things. Uh, Joseph Duran basically, or, or you know, it's very Edwards Deming, uh, had the rule of, of 85 that said 85 of most 85 percent of most quality problems rest with management. So if management empowers their employees uh, to make recommendations, uh, then of course that's going to make the process better. And of course, nothing worse than automating a bad process just makes the bad process work faster. So we're always trying to look for improvements that could be made uh, prior to the automation process. Also, looking at down the future, you're looking at the future here, not just looking at the snapshot in time, but what are some intended uses that might be out there that we can also kind of factor into the process uh, to, uh, you know, provide additional levels of information, additional levels of detail. Uh, we can look at, you know, those other unintended use, uses. Ultimately, workshops, one of my favorite tools that really just expedite the overall process. Uh, really, we actually use a lot of the things listed here in the workshops, including things like doing prototypes uh, uh, as well. So workshops uh, are just a good fast-paced way of doing a requirements workshop that streamlines the requirements identification, uh, elicitation, and documentation process, and get that vetted uh, as well as part of the workshop activity. And of course, again, making it visual is key here. So again, there's a lot of tools at our disposal. It's appropriate then just to kind of pick and choose the combination of techniques, not just one technique, but the combination of techniques, again, if you, if elicitation efforts may fail, if you pick the wrong method. So that's why I typically, you typically like to use several uh, techniques uh, that kind of comes at the requirements of different angles and helps us then to get a true picture of what's going on uh, in this organization, this domain, and pinpoint their requirements. Now, certainly, as we begin to look at the tools and techniques, uh, again, that visualization, as I mentioned, is, is critically important, to all about uh, prototyping and organizing the information. Certainly, whatever we're doing here, uh, you know, is whenever I'm doing prototyping, I say do it early, uh, do it often, but always do it with a purpose. So there's going to be some end product that will come out of there that will add value to the overall requirements we're, we're capturing here. Uh, again, yeah, process flow diagrams, uh, uh, swim lane diagrams are all appropriate. I mentioned again, of course, the context diagram as, as now at the outset. And I've had customers sometimes where I'll give them some written requirements. They'll say, I don't think this quite hits the topic we're, we're trying to cover here. I'll go back and maybe do a little prototype of that. And they'll say, oh, wait a minute, that, yeah, okay, now I'm getting that. 
because the visualization helps so, you know written text goes only goes so far visualization just helps to 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 gather and gain more understanding as the overall process so again you know, just trying to compare and contrast different business processes can be another kind of insight into a little window of opportunity into get better understanding and so we're just trying to you know look at the uh, review uh, write uh, rewrite the requirements until uh, they are appropriate uh, but at the same time uh, trying to engage them in that whole visualization of the way they're doing business uh, maybe you can do a, a, a use case model which consists of a use case diagram and a use case narrative and of course then the the the, the, the diagram provides the visual uh, the narrative def defines the step-by-step -step process and gets into detailed requirements and so we really have to understand the processes trying to to delineate those trying to document those uh, trying to organize those so we, we gain uh, both from our perspective at understanding uh, as well as the customer ultimately the development team has to get a window into this as well uh, to better understand the, the business processes visualization uh, is key of course next up we have to be prepared that uh, once we select the appropriate uh, elicitation techniques and so I have to you know figure out what am I trying to get from this elicitation technique as it relates to the requirements once the scope has been done down of course I like to take that laser guided folks focus if we have really well-defined vision very well-defined focus that helps our efforts to be more focused as well as we attempt to elicit the uh, requirements uh, from the various stakeholders and of course an important part of preparation is scheduling the resources I mean the big job if you're doing a requirements workshop uh, not as big a job if you're maybe just doing a one-on-one -on -one interview I mean preparation is important for both of those it's just the extent of the preparation required because again if you're doing a workshop you got to line up the facilities you got to have equipment flip charts overhead projectors you got people freed up from their regular job responsibilities for the for the workshop if that's what you're doing there so again it applies either way you know either large or large scale or smaller scale and certainly just let people know you know what what our approach is uh, you know maybe sending an agenda out in, in, in advance uh, letting them know what the topic's all about is an important part of becoming prepared uh, for that elicitation activity again there's just a, a, a little bit more detailed listing of some of the elicitation techniques we can engage in the overall process here and yet yeah, JAD's been around for a long time kind of a precursor of agile if you will uh, so again some things we've talked about uh, some we haven't talked about but again just try to once again scan the environment and use whatever technique or combination of techniques we think will work the best uh, to document those requirements step five of course is capturing the results of your elicitation activity uh, which needs to be documented uh, so we do generate that right conversation and so this is all about trying to make sure we kind of detail you know when's this event going to happen uh, who are all the key players uh, what uh, should that outcome look like as a result of that uh, elicitation event and of course we then we'll detail that we mentioned that the very detailed agenda uh, looking at again the, the availability of the various resources uh, and so now we're, you know, we're we, we planned it now we're documenting that and again this is trying to formalize what we normally kind of do off the cuff I think the more we formalize this the more effective it will be in our assignments and it will lead to you know in, improved project uh, successful outcomes one way of getting the ball rolling here in the overall process then is building a straw man uh, which is just looking at uh, just the high level view of what we think they want just for something to begin begin to chew on as as, as a group and of course we'll take uh, what 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 might not be complete information uh, just as a beginning point to have that discussion until we, we we thoroughly understand what's going on with this process so initially don't, don't make it too good uh, just to get get a starting point so we, we have something to be able to review uh, so we can get a better idea about kind of where this is headed in terms of documenting the requirements and so I mean the purpose of this uh, is to just uh, show something allow people to kind of mull it over and knock it down rebuild it uh, ultimately getting better and better along the way so at least having something as a starting point can go a long ways in expediting your requirements process as opposed to everybody looking at each other across the room and saying oh I think I know what you want to do but I'm not exactly sure and you know yada 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 it goes on you know for 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 an hour or two and we don't really make a lot of progress we've got something to, to look at to, to mull over it, it, it just kind of kickstarts your process 
and helps to facilitate this uh, to better successful outcomes. Step six then uh, is to uh, make sure people are prepared for this solicitation activity. So uh, that means you have to send out things like I mentioned, an agenda out in advance, uh, uh, maybe some material they need to review so they're prepared or at least a topic to discuss. I mean, if it's a brainstorming session, they have to have something they're going to be brainstorming around. So they should have that in advance. They kind of know, you know, what, what this is going to be all about, uh, whether it's a workshop, uh, requirements workshop, uh, whether it, uh, it is an interview, you know, whatever venue that might be. It's important to ensure that the people that are going to be engaged are prepared with the appropriate information so that they can, uh, you know, really just make this more effective uh, so that, uh, you know, we, we can add value uh, and uh, have a common understanding about what we're, we're there for and ultimately what we should be accomplishing. And again, yeah, encourage them. They don't always do it, but encourage them to, to review the material, to be prepared prior to that event uh, taking place. Now, certainly there can be some problems with elicitation. Uh, I think we've all probably seen many. Uh, you know, maybe there's no one source of knowledge uh, for that business domain, so you got to tap into a variety of people. Then, of course, if you're the business analyst, the project manager doing this, uh, then you probably know more about this than, than the overall business does because they just know their niche that they're responsible for. So that can be an issue. Uh, especially if this is a, a system that's maybe a, a vendor product, uh, we may not have institutional knowledge that knows a lot about that. They just know about the usage of it, and so that might be an issue. Also, we really can't get a window into seeing the people if we're going to be doing some observation. They're not available. They're in a distant location, and so again, there can be a you know not a window into uh, observing the work processes are available. Of course, also the knowledge is tacit. So again, some people might have one view, uh, other people might have a larger view. This is, you know, this is like an elephant. Uh, no, this is like a mosquito. And we got got an issue about sizing of this. So again, that that can can be a big consideration, and can be a problem in in, in gaining that that understanding, and and uh, resulting in in good elicitation could be a problem, unless uh, we actively address those holes. Step seven then is to make sure we elicit the, the, the requirements from the stakeholders, again, all this preparation. This is when, when, when the heavy lifting begins, I mentioned. So this is when the real work begins, when we're engaged in those requirements activities, which means we're just trying to grow that understanding, growing that knowledge. Hopefully we know what we're looking for. Uh, we've got a straw man out there, maybe some prototypes, some visualizations, uh, some preliminary written out requirements that we're trying to you know, gain uh, you know, a you know, better appreciation for. So this is kind of a discovery process as we're engaging in you know, whatever the, the elicitation uh, series of events we, we, we've engaged in. It's all about making sure we facilitate good the communication amongst all the various players to make sure we kind of know what's important, what's of value. Uh, sometimes there might be a difference of opinion about what direction we should be going. And so it's really trying to create a good environment. Of course, that is our job in, in the elicitation business to create an environment for success so we can list, it, list those requirements. Of course, a good old end of uh, uh, engagement activity question would be, uh, anybody else out there that might be a, a, you know, a, a, another good source of requirements for this business system we're trying to implement? And so again, this is really where uh, we, we get, get, get involved in the process. Now, of course, some good how questions uh, that are appropriate for us as we engage the stakeholders. How are you going to be using this feature as a key beginning point? Uh, is this a feature of process? And if so, uh, what steps are involved in that process? Uh, what are the steps that are involved here that, 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 are, that are relevant? Which ones are not relevant? Uh, what's your needs out there? And how can we best meet their needs? Uh, how this could be used in, in maybe multiple forms, multiple formats? And uh, ultimately, what does done look like? How do we know if we're, we're completed, that overall process there? And so that's always a starting point, asking the how questions. Of course, then there's the where questions, the when questions, the who questions, the what questions, uh, the, the why questions. So we get into the W's there along with the, with the, with the H's. And so it's really trying to, to get, delve into the details in more depth, whether that's involved in an interview or a requirements workshop. Again, we're still trying to ask those questions to effectively elicit the information. Step eight, uh, this is something we uh, 
always uh, probably don't always think about, but it's something we, we know we always need to do. Now, in third grade, I received a penmanship award. I think after that, uh, my um, uh, my writing ability went way downhill. Now uh, I've got a, a benign tremor that's <laughs> developed over the years. And so I, I, I don't write very well anymore. So, you know, you have to have some way of capturing the results of your elicitation event. Um, work, I was working with a, a hospital in, in Southern California recently, and I uh, was doing a BA class. And the BAs, uh, when they wanted something off the record, they say, click the pen, click the pen. I said, you know, what's up with this click the pen? They actually used a pen, which is a recording device, and they actually used that in their interviews. And whenever they wanted something off the record, they'd say, click the pen so it wouldn't be recorded. And so, I mean, that's another uh, activity. Uh, I did some work with the, the BYU-Idaho, the university I mentioned earlier. Uh, we did a series of workshops. And I, I did a lot, a lot of whiteboarding with uh, use, uh, use uh, case diagrams. Uh, we also had a student secretary scribing the meeting and somebody else said, I got my Mac here, do you want me to just record this? And so you typically want some multiple uh, tools to be able to use to actually capture the information so we get it right. Nothing worse than going back and saying, oh yeah, great meeting. We either lost or we didn't take good notes. And so again, this is, really getting good value requirements. If we miss that, it's kind of just, just just slipping through our fingers, and so we don't want that to happen. You can use things like dialogue maps. Uh, uh, you can, uh, of course, use a variety of other tools. Uh, I like mind mapping as well. Uh, use case diagrams, another way of visualizing that. So, so again, there are a lot of ways of capturing this information. As I mentioned, make it as visual as you can. The big screen projectors, whiteboards are always handy. Uh, so just make sure we, we do that. Of course, ultimately, once we've collected the notes, we want to make sure that the stakeholders are all aware. We'll be sending those back for their review to, to you know, get some feedback on these. You know, do we cover everything? Do we miss some things? Did we misunderstand some things you had said in the meeting? And so we're just trying to make sure that we, we let them know we want them to be able to review and provide feedback of the results of that. And maybe, you know, let, let them know we may have to have some follow-up activities uh, after the fact as well. Again. You'll never capture everything that, uh, that that went on in that, that interview or that uh, workshop, but we're striving to get as, it as accurate as we can. Uh, we're striving for perfection, but that's just a striving uh, activity. Now, I also like to set aside some time, especially on interviews after the event, uh, to kind of reflect on what I heard with my notes handy uh, so that I'm able to pick up and usually I got some things bounce around in my head after the interview or after the workshop or after the brainstorm event that are still there uh, but I just haven't gotten them down on paper so I like to allocate half an hour 45 minutes after the event just to reflect on how that went and, and usually some things uh, will come back to me that weren't originally in my notes and so I just like to you know kind of make sure that I, I preserve some time to be able to do that kind of activity after the elicitation event uh, has occurred. Here's just an example of a dialogue map. So again, uh, this could be done by the, the facilitator, uh, could be done by uh, a scribe. Uh, it's just, just kind of capturing the results of the dialogue that went on. And uh, just, uh, once again, very visualization the way the process uh, is playing out. Here's an example of a mind map. I like to draw a mind map sometimes on the whiteboard while I'm talking to uh, stakeholders. Or if we have a you know large group meeting, we can sketch this off. I even do this one on one uh, on occasion, but it just kind of visualizes that going from you know one side to the other. And actually, I was getting ready for my CBAP examination. I mind mapped the entire Baybach guide. This is 2.0, <laughs> so that was kind of crazy making. But anyway, it got me really into do, doing mind maps, and just another way of documenting the results of of, of an activity or or, or or an elicitation event. Another valuable tool in, in my arsenal would be a use case diagram. So again, we identify the actors, uh, we identify the use cases, and we just draw those. And I mean, very easy to draw all these on the whiteboard somewhere way as a, as a first blush look. And we identify a use case, so you identify the primary actor, you identify the secondary actors over on the right-hand side there. You show the association with the lines connecting there. So once again, just a good way of capturing some requirements. So easy on. I did this with the Department of Energy a couple of years ago. Uh, they wanted to build a system, track everything, all the assets on the internet, routers, servers, computers. 
And so they wanted kind of an inventory management system. And so I met with all the nine departments uh, in a conference room with a whiteboard. I just sketched out all the use case diagrams. And these are all high level use case diagrams. And that was the end product uh, that I generated uh, by the, you know, you know, for, for this, this, uh, this contract. And so again, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, again, copious note taking course is also on the table here to ensure we're capturing the right information. Of course, another added value here is to have a standardized requirements template. Now, if you're doing waterfall, that's appropriate. Uh, you can also do this with user stories if you're doing agile and, and create your product backlog, uh, you know, kind of the same thing here, but just some way of creating a framework. I mean, in a traditional BRD, for instance, you have, you know, like business requirements, you have a section for that, you have a section for stakeholder requirements, you have a stake, uh, section for solution requirements, you have a section for functional non-functional requirements, uh, 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 assumption section, constraint section. And so if this is kind of formatted consistently and used consistently across the enterprise, then we're all doing this the same way. If you're doing a product backlog, uh, you know, you just create that product backlog in uh, Team Foundation Server, uh, TFS, uh, or in JIRA. Uh, I've even used Trello boards uh, to capture the information we're doing agile uh, projects. Uh, and so you just have to, you know, understand the form and format, uh, trying to make that as consistent as possible, which means you could, good idea to have standards out there. As we indicate there, no need to go back and reinvent the wheel every time. We're trying to become more consistent, especially with the stakeholders so that they kind of know what to expect in that engagement. And it just helps us to, to, to bring that additional level of understanding as well as standardization. Of course, uh, one of my favorite cartoons here. So a little tongue in cheek here uh, from Dilbert, uh, but, but still probably more true than we care to admit sometimes about what goes on as part of this requirements process. I mean, I've had uh, uh, vice presidents of finance. We're going to do a new finance system. It's going to be replaced. They said, we don't need requirements. So let's just go out and buy the system. And I said, oh, wait, well, I think we still need to do requirements. There's interfaces, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and then they did say, well, you know, if I want a word processor, I just go out and buy Word. I don't have to do requirements. And I said, well, this is a little bigger than Word. And eventually I convinced them that, yeah, we need to go about doing requirements, really just go out and buying something. Even if it's a vendor package, uh, you know, it's important we do still uh, invest the time in, in effectively documenting our requirements. Step number 10 then is to continue to, to evaluate or to validate those overall requirements. Uh, ultimately, so we hit the target so that the stakeholders are happy with that end product. Uh, as well as, of course, that has to be vetted by the people that actually be doing the development process or implementing the solution is another you know, aspect of what we're trying to do here. And so really trying to uh, approach this from a, kind of some validation checks along the way, just to make sure the, 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 the usage that's going to be required here is uh, clearly documented and captured in the form of our requirements. Ultimately, the requirements should detail what are the, the needs of those stakeholders, and of course, the good old classic V and V here. I did some work with a pharmaceutical company a few years ago in Chicago. They were under a consent decree from the FDA because they didn't have good validation verification processes in place. Uh, consequently, they had products taken off the market. Uh, they had uh, uh, fines, millions of dollars fines levied against them because their IT group did not have good V and V protocols in place. They really had no QA no quality programs going whatsoever. And of course, the FDA made a good argument. Uh, well, if you don't have a good validation verification of your business, your, your IT processes, especially like your requirements process, what's to say you won't plant or, or print a wrong label on a prescription because you don't have good uh, you know, QA in place to be able to support that. So, so that's when I got, we actually created some verification validation processes and QA processes, train them and got them out from under the consent decree just because they didn't formalize this. So we need to be really crisp uh, and, and good at validation, which means that we are building the right product uh, verification or we're building the product right. And so those are key in successful outcomes, especially for your requirements uh, you're, you're, you're generating here. And so we have to have you know, good mechanisms to be able to verify and validate the information or it may not be on target. It's all about writing, rewriting, understanding, and effectively documenting those uh, by use of the appropriate uh, elicitation methods. 
Now here are kind of five top mistakes are made as part of requirements validation. First off, of course, you know, we have to have everybody on board here. Again, if you're doing agile well, you got the whole team there, including your product owner, you got your scrum master, and you got your team. And of course, uh, you know, you need to collaborate as you review those requirements, whether that be uh, uh, prior to a sprint, as you just in time decompose your requirements, or if you're doing a waterfall project, you have to get together at a some some point at a requirements review uh, to get feedback on those requirements. Uh, this is what I find actually doing a class uh, right now, a, 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 a business analyst class, and uh, it dawned on the class all of a sudden that, uh, hey, we don't differentiate between requirements. Everything's thrown in the same hopper. There's no no variation. Everything's the same. And of course, as I mentioned, you have to have business requirements, which are high level, kind of visionary. You have stakeholder requirements, which gets into a little bit more detail. You have solution requirements, which kind of a a, 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 a linkage then between the uh, the business requirement and the solution requirement that would be the stakeholder requirement, and of course those break down into functional and non-functional requirements. I mentioned business rules, data requirements, uh, non-functional requirements. As I mentioned, uh, quality of service requirements. So there are actually different categories of requirement types. If you're not aware of that, that's going to be an issue because there's going to be a hodgepodge of requirements all thrown in there, so we have to have that level of differentiation. We have to really listen for the various kinds of requirements as we are eliciting the uh, requirements. Also, again, not getting a lot of visuals in there, as I mentioned, not putting things into proper perspective can be a big issue. So again, that's a mistake. Also, uh, sometimes we spend, actually a client wanted me to, uh, to document the as-is process for one of their domains, uh, generated a 100-page requirements document, uh, uh, spent uh, you know a couple of weeks on that. Uh, you know they they didn't actually do anything with it. They just wanted it documented, but they didn't know why. So again, sometimes too much on the as is. I mean, we have to know that baseline to go to the to be. And so I mean, we, we then do of course do that that uh, that gap analysis between the the, the as is and to be. And then of course, uh, you know, allocating requirements too early in the application. I mean, this jumps into the solution before we've actually completely and thoroughly defined the requirements. We don't want to rush headlong into the solution until we actually know what the requirements are. I mean, this can be done typically through a traceability matrix as those requirements are al allocated. It can help us then to make sure, first off, they're allocated in the right sequence uh, based on priorities uh, as well as they're allocated and actually all been used in, in the implementation uh, of the solution. Okay, so just to revisit uh, that definition of requirement solicitation, again, as we, we detailed it before, it's all about discovering, reviewing, documenting, ultimately understanding the, uh, the you know, again, the, the user needs, the constraints. Uh, so just to kind of reflect on maybe a little lessons learned uh, from this webinar, just kind of think about uh, what can you do differently uh, based on this presentation? You know, what can you begin to apply directly back on the job? How can you begin to then to maybe improve your overall elicitation methods? Thinking in terms of what can I do in the short term? What can I start doing this week, next week, this month? What can I do in the long term, in the next six months or a year? Just trying to improve how I go about doing elicitation. Hopefully you can think about that and begin to apply that uh, back on the job. Okay, again, here's all the 10 topics we covered in this uh, segment in the webinar today. Hopefully this has been adding value. Uh, there's the next six uh, that kind of details uh, what uh, we covered in today's presentation. Okay, so uh, that completes my presentation. Uh, we'll turn the time back over to Leah to wrap things up. Thank you, Terrell. Terrell will be answering some questions in just a few minutes. So if you have a question for Terrell, you can chat it in now in the question box and that you can find in the bottom right hand of your GoToMeeting screen. If you are looking to develop your team's business analysis skills, consider delivering one of our training programs on site or virtually to your organization. CEG can also develop a tailored training program based on your specific talent development challenges and goals. You can connect with one of our enterprise training advisors to discuss which talent development solutions will best fit your needs or visit our website at www.corpedgroup.com. There you can view our schedule of open enrollment courses and uh, the courses are also available online and virtual in the Boston area.
To speak with an Enterprise Training Advisor, you can call us at 1-800-288-7246 or email info at corpedgroup.com. Okay, we do have time for uh, one or two questions, Terrell. So if uh, you're good, I have one coming in right now. I am ready. Thank you. So the first one is, what are some of the challenges when doing a licitation? Um, that is always a, a big issue. Uh, I mean, just, you know, some of the some of the best practices that have been kind of accumulated over the years and it has to do with uh, you know, trying to make sure that we first off get the right information. From my experience, we have a clear definition of where the project is headed. Once again, this is a vision doing things like uh, elevator pitches. Uh, another thing we sometimes use called box designs. We have kind of like a like a software box. You pick it up and look at what, what features this provides. We're trying to really understand the vision, uh, the the direction, and some of the features. Uh, and if you get that clearly in mind. Uh, then uh, it, it just helps you to to focus on what you're after. What also helps you to better focus on what kind of licitation techniques might be best uh, to be able to engage the stakeholders uh, and properly elicit the information. So I think having a clear direction like that laser guided focus I mentioned earlier is key to kind of knowing where you're going and then picking the appropriate to tools and techniques. As I mentioned, typically a combination of tools and techniques uh, bode a lot better then maybe just using uh, classically one or two techniques. Thank you. Okay, second question in. Are there any combination of techniques that you would recommend? You know, I think uh, basic uh, methods to, to keep in mind here is, you know, if I'm doing, uh, um, just getting started, uh, I'll typically do a document review and then do some job shadowing. Uh, which also might be incorporated with some interviews if if we can do some 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 on-site uh, uh, you know active type type job shadowing. So so yeah, we we understand the, the process by doing the document review. Uh, we then understand uh, the way that's currently playing out by the observation, and then we interview them to clarify any questions. So that'd just be one instance of kind of using you know, a combination of three techniques leveraged together uh, to best uh, support that. Uh, I, I've, I've found JAD sessions very helpful, which are basically workshops. And so whenever you're doing a workshop, you're actually using a combination of techniques. I mean, you might in that workshop do a brainstorming session. You might do some prototyping. Um, of course, you, you will, will you know, pr probably doing some group interviews on occasion in that, 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 that engagement. So, so just the whole nature of doing like a requirements workshop, you're typically using multiple techniques anyway. Kind of goes back to years ago when I used to do JAD sessions, Joint Application Development, or RAD session, Rapid Application Development. Uh, try to incorporate a multitude of techniques, which I think really makes those a lot more efficient. Uh, it typically streamlines the process. It makes it a whole lot more efficient. I mean, I've had instances where, where the you know, manager wants to expedite the process and say, well, you know, can you get your resources available for a week long engagement? They say, well, that's a lot of time. And they say, well, pay me now or pay me now a lot more later. So we can either expedite that by a workshop using, again, you know, all those techniques I just detailed there, just uh, again, help, help to get that done. And like I've been saying, you know, from my experience, uh, the more the solicitation techniques, the merrier. Uh, have to, of course, use these smartly. We just don't throw them in there helter skelter, but we organize, as we talked about in the session today, organize our approach, plan our approach, and then direct that uh, to the very best efficient efforts in, in gathering and documenting requirements. Thank you, Terrell. All right, we're going to wrap things up right now. We'd like to thank you for attending our presentation, 10 Steps to Effective Elicitation Requirements. You can ask Terrell additional questions on our LinkedIn group page. I have chatted out that link to our group page where you can submit your questions and continue this conversation. Don't forget this webinar does qualify for one PDU. The course number for the webinar is BAW. 1318. I repeat, that's BAW 1318. It can be reported under category A. And our PMI provider number is 1011. Feel free to contact us and check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for attending, and thank you, Tower, for a great webinar. Have a fabulous day. Thank you, Leah, and thanks everybody for attending today. It's been a pleasure having you in the webinar, and good luck on eliciting requirements.